This show was not hyped in the slightest until the final week. Fastlane 2023 is just a transitional show. It's clear that they're saving everything for Survivor Series. Because of that, it's not a must-see show. The show was always very calm, nothing big or intense, but there was some highlights. So right now, let's talk about it. The first match was the Undisputed Tag Team Championships. The Judgment Day, Finn Balor and Damian Priest defended the gold against Cody Rhodes and Jey Uso. Ever since Jey Uso moved to Raw, his career's taken an upswing of sorts. Being away from the bloodline allows for him to develop more into his own guy. You can't say the same for Jimmy. Jey is one of the most popular wrestlers in the entire WWE and is fresh. His presence is welcomed and much appreciated by the fans. He's been courted by the Judgment Day for a while now and after turning them down, Cody Rhodes made the save. Cody in general seemed like he cooled off after SummerSlam and he wasn't doing much, but just watching his entrance on SmackDown proves everything about him being forgotten and cold. False. It's wrong. With that said, this match was strong. It started off casual with Jay being dominated by the experienced tag team. Cody's tag didn't and it's all hype. Like, it was one of the biggest reactions on the entire show. It just was. They exploded when Cody came in. He had all the momentum, match kicks up, and it didn't need interference on the Judgment Day. It was good on its own. Jay refused to fold to Rio. JD McDonough was there trying to get an official spot in the group. The near fall with the briefcase was wild, but in the end, not only did the Judgment Day's plan fail, but JD McDonough accidentally cost them the tag team titles. It didn't really set in that Jay and Cody Rhodes were tag team champions until a press conference, but here, it's all good. It looked like Universe Mode Tag Team. Personally speaking, I didn't think they'd actually win it, but it gives both men a story because at the end of the day, their main storyline is with Jimmy and in Cody's case, Roman Reigns. It kinda should've been Sami Zayn here, but that's complicated. Good match, they paced it well, but it's nothing special. The near fall though with a briefcase was amazing. I believe that they would retain it there. Then on a press conference, Jay looks zooted talking nonsense while Cody's a straight up guy who speaks eloquently. Both really are different sides of the same coin. Born into the business, finding their way through it alone. They match well. It's kind of weird, it doesn't really make sense. But seeing their interview at the press conference, yeah, they fit well. And I'm interested in seeing where this tag team goes. Okay, the next match was a six-man tag team match. Montez Ford, Angelo Dawkins, and Bobby Lashley faced Rey Mysterio, Santos Escobar, and a mystery partner. The mystery partner was not around for most of the match. But with that said, Lashley's finally on TV, which is welcomed. And I think people forget just how well this guy was doing a year and a half. Well, maybe not the fans, but WWE themselves. Perhaps this her business could be an opportunity to return to the very top. Will it be? Possibly not. Things are tied up there at the moment and Lashley's getting older. But at the end of the day though, he's helping the street profits a lot, giving them a fresh change. This match was very basic. It felt like a match from SmackDown and the mystery partner didn't appear until the very end when it was revealed that Carlito was here. The crowd went crazy. He started wrestling like it was 2005 and drove his team to victory. So they finally gave him plans. I guess to join the LWO? It should have happened a long time ago and all WWE did was delay the obvious. But this is my mouth jumping to conclusions. We don't know if he's an official member, but regardless his story in the beginning of his return should be intertwined with the LWO. I'm very interested in seeing where he goes, but one thing that was strange was his theme song. WWE doesn't retain theme songs anymore, and as memorable as Carlitos was, it didn't bring it back. Okay, the next match was a triple threat match for the SmackDown Women's Championship. EO Sky defended the gold against Charlotte and Asuka. Another triple threat match in the SmackDown Women's Division. EO Sky has been pushed hard recently, and I think she's going to be the next big baby face for SmackDown, especially once the story with Bayley escalates. As for this match, good. It was better than the SummerSlam match involving Bianca Belair. Charlotte to me was the star here, she showed up big time, she stood out, was excited. Sometimes her performances don't hit hard, but when they do, she makes a dent. The other two did well, especially after Asuka spat green mist in the beginning. EO told Bailey earlier on not to interfere, and to be honest, I thought another Charlotte title reign was happening, but they made sure to make the champion look good, despite a moment of distraction. She even pinned Charlotte too. But at the same time, Asuka was tapping onto the figure eight, so we all know how this goes. There's probably going to be a singles match between those two. EO retains despite Bailey's efforts. Okay, the next match is a tag team match. John Cena and LA Knight faced Solo Sokoa and Jimmy Uso. Pat McAfee came out to greet his old fans. You know, he used to play for the Colts. They obviously love him. Now, John Cena's been back. It's mostly calm. No intention to go all out with this run because I'm assuming he comes at a weird spot in the year. And in addition, I don't think they expect John Cena to go all out as well. LA Knight's been popular for a minute now. This guy's going places and it really, really, really looks like this guy is going to have a great year in 2024. All right, with that said, the match gave off a SmackDown vibe, but I'm glad it was on the card. It was very basic, but brought out the best in all four men. Funny enough, John Cena was being dominated and LA Knight was the big babyface. Cena took this long ass beating, you'd think his name was the prototype. He was back to his jobber days for a bit, and when LA Knight was tagged in, that crowd lost. It was such a normal tag team match, though. Nothing special about it, but that was more than enough for the fans. LA Knight was basically John Cena for this match. He got to be John Cena. 
They went through the heels. LA Knight scored the victory. And yet another endorsement from John Cena. Fun stuff. It's not going to be the best match in the show, but it was very enjoyable. John Cena isn't going to be around for long. He's going away. But LA Knight gets to benefit. He gets all the benefits. And I expect him to face Roman Reigns in the near future. As for this Bloodline story, it looks like Roman's probably going to be disappointed with Solo and Jimmy losing. They're probably going to crumble right before WrestleMania, but we'll see. And the main event, Seth Rollins defends the World Heavyweight Championship against Shinsuke Nakamura in a last man standing match. A story rooted in pride. Seth Rollins has struggled with being the guy to carry Raw. He can't understand that sometimes it's better to live to fight another day. He barely beat Nakamura, and this rematch was basically him getting the job done. The match itself was good. It took a while to pick up. Nakamura felt like a a very dangerous threat that didn't overlook that back injury in the slightest and made sure to exploit it any chance he got. Rounds didn't have a significant streak of momentum, it was mostly the challenger. He was locked in. Rounds was suffering, but he refused to stay down. There was this one moment where Nakamura spat the red mist where I thought it was over and it made too much sense. The title was changing hands, but he recovered. And when he did score the victory, it was out of pure luck. He was lucky that Nakamura didn't survive. And that's the story of the title reign. Rollins' run has went from a champion that fights all comers and wins on his own merit, dominantly, to a man that needs external sources such as Nakamura's legs giving out, making a random mistake. It's not a matter of Seth Rollins showing up when it matters most, but more so a situation where he gets to benefit from others' mistake. Both men showed up, Rollins more so. He played the role of a struggling babyface very well. And if we're talking logically, he's gonna get mauled and lose the title decisively because of his poor decisions. That's the story here. I wouldn't be shocked if he loses it on a random run to Gunther or someone. Probably Gunther. The main question is how can he maintain it? How can he maintain this streak and keep his title? As for Nakamura, he's the ultimate bottler like Finn Balor. These two in storyline are allergic to winning the world title. I do think it's a bit unfortunate, you know, but it just came at a wrong time. They're fully invested in Seth Rollins and this title reign right now. The story of him trying to keep up with his opponents and stuff like that. In other ways, Nakamura could have been this champion that takes out others, destroys their backs, arms, whatever. It was a nice transition for what he was doing previously. This shark that smells blood type character would have done well as the world champion, but it is what it is. All right, that's fast lane. This is a good event. It wasn't great. I'm not going to say it was great. It was very enjoyable. Passed by quickly. We got to see Jade Cargill show up at one moment during the pre-show, which I thought was cool. She does not look out of place in WWE. She fits like a glove. She belongs in WWE. This is the place for her. They're treating her like a huge star. They make her seem like a big deal, which to be honest, she is. She's going to achieve a lot in WWE. We, hell, she might win the Royal Rumble in a couple of months. We'll see. But other than that, the show passed by quickly. Enjoyable stuff. And sometimes you need to put seven matches on there. I did think it was strange that there was five matches on the show, but they made the right decision here. Five matches, all of them felt important in their own way. Carlito returned, which was awesome. John Cena and LA Knight teaming up. Crowd was all in. Yosuke overcoming Asuka and Charlotte. And of course, the main event where Seth Rollins barely beat Shinsuke Nakamura. So it was a good event. If I had a problem with this event, it's the fact that it didn't feel like a big deal. That's the only thing. At the end of the day, some of these matches did belong on SmackDown. John Cena, LA Knight, Sosa Kota tag team match, Jimmy Uso tag team match, they belonged on SmackDown, but I guess they're trying to save everything for Crown Jewel and Survivor Series, so we'll see. Alright, what you guys think of Fast Lane 2023? Please comment down below, and that's it for this video. Make sure you hit the crossroads on the like button, and perhaps the curb stop on the subscribe button. Peace, I'm out.